Hi, Bob. Hi, Al. Just came over to let you know. Hey, you got to see my latest investment. Oh, sure, Al. Check it out. Did you ever see a big screen as big as this? Wow, that's pretty big. Oh, yeah. We had to take the wall out to get it in. Oh. And how about this new stereo system, huh? Wow, that's a lot of equipment. Nothing but top of the line, guy. Ever seen so many buttons? Not really, no. Listen, I can make the music sound real tinny or real bassy. That's impressive. Hey, that's the X900. And for a hundred bucks more, I got this little button here. Oh, what's that do? Well, I don't remember now, but it was cool. These speakers cost me more than my golf clubs. Wow, that's quite a bit. Nah, I'll just hold off on the new satellite dish for the RV. Well, hey, listen, I just came over to let you know we still have an opening in the Christian school. Thought you'd like to enroll your son. Uh, gee, Bob, right now I really can't afford it. Afford it. Afford it. Priorities. Where are yours? A message from Lifeline Productions, 1-800-523-8669, lifelinepro.com. Good morning, this is Radio Good News. The goal of this program is to draw all people to the love of Jesus Christ. I want everyone to know and experience the fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are key to a Holy Spirit-filled and successful Christian life. I will focus on God's love because God's love is wonderful. I'm John Thornton. You can write to me at Radio Good News, P.O. Box 1722, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, 57101. I'll be reading from the Bible, the New Revised Standard Version, because that is God's word to us in our modern English language. Let's begin today with Psalm 107, verses 1 through 9. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures Forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those he redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to an inhabited town. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way until they reached an inhabited town. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful work to humankind, for he satisfies the thirsty and the hungry he fills with good things. Those are God's words from Psalm 107, verses 1 through 9. Turn with me, if you can, to Matthew's Gospel, to Matthew chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. Jesus told the crowd all these things in parables. Without a parable, he told them nothing. This was to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth to speak in parables. I will proclaim what has been hidden from the foundation of the world. Those are God's words from Matthew chapter 13, verses 34 through 35. Usually at this stage in the program we have a scripture lesson, but this morning we have a very special guest. On the phone with me this morning is Bill Myers. Now, Bill Myers is the best-selling author of books for both children and adults, including some series you might know, the McGee and Me series, The Incredible Worlds of Wally McDougal, and some really great books, the Forbidden Doors series, The Face of God, Eli, the trilogy, Blood of Heaven, Threshold, and Fire of Heaven, and a short story, the When the Last Leaf Falls. Bill Myers is a writer and director whose work has won over 40 national and international awards and whose books and videos have sold nearly 6 million copies. And more importantly than that, Bill Myers is a really great guy. Bill Myers, welcome to Radio Good News. Oh, thanks. It's great to be here. So, Bill, today let's talk about your book, The Bloodstone Chronicles. What kind of book is that? Oh, it's, um, it's I think, about my favorite kids' book I've ever written. I've written about 60 kids' books. And, and this one is a, it's a fantasy allegory, part mm, Pilgrim's Progress, part Chronicles of Narnia, uh, what it deals with is in, it's actually four books in one. Uh, each of the four books deals with a specific area of growth from seeker to uh, somebody that finally accepts what Christ did for them, uh, all the way through the lordship and disciple being a disciple of Christ, but it never uses a Christian phrase and it never uses a Christian um, parable, if you will, or, or not, no, that's, that's incorrect, it is a parable, it never uses past Christian history, it, it puts it all in a parable fiction type of form that has a lot of fantasy and a lot of action to hold the reader's attention, but at the same time it very, very clearly goes down the path 
of, uh, of the growth of the Christian life. So, Bill, when you say fantasy, first thing that comes to my mind is the popularity of Harry Potter today. That's a fantasy book that's really popular. How does the Bloodstone Chronicles differ from something like Harry Potter? Oh, that's a great question. Um, nothing in the Bloodstone Chronicles deals with the occult. As we know, a lot of Harry Potter deals with witchcraft and sorcery and things that Scripture makes pretty clear we're not supposed to fool around with. Uh, as opposed to with the Bloodstone Chronicles taking stories and weaving them in such a way that uh, that deal with fantasy and, and extraordinary situations. I, I could give you an example. Um, in the second book, uh, called The Experiment, Denise, uh, the young lady in, in the series, uh, there's a girl and two boys, uh, the girl in the series, everybody keeps telling her God is a loving father. Well, that does her no good because her father left her when she was four and she doesn't know anything about him. So she's whisked off to this dimension of science and mathematics and she's allowed to create her own life form under the you know uh, under the supervision of god she's allowed to create her own little life forms and they fall in love with her and she falls in love with them and there's this wonderful creator creation relationship that begins to form until sin enters her little community and that's and, with gus and gertrude yes yes and they start um they, they start destroying themselves through, uh, through some sin. And it, it, she's beside herself, so she creates a sign that says, stop doing this, and then half of the community starts worshiping the sign, just like legalism takes over, people that are bound to the law. So now she's got half of the community killing themselves through sin, the other half carrying this law that is destroying them, and she doesn't know what to do until at the last second she has an idea that maybe the only way she can reach these people is to miniaturize herself down to their size and talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. And she does that. They respond um, negatively for a moment. She's, she's killed. She comes back to life at the end of the experiment. And when the book is finally done, she realizes, so this is the love God has for me, a love so deep that he would even let himself be killed if it meant that he could save me. So the audience, and particularly the girl, walk away from that second story in the book fully understanding the depth of God's love for us on the cross. So Bill, tell us more about the characters. You told us a little bit about Denise, but there's also Josh and Nathan. What are these people like? Mm, well, Denise is um, sort of a tomboy and, and, and uh, kind of tough. You have to prove things to her, uh, but not at all like Josh, who's, uh, I believe he's in eighth grade. Uh, he is uh, a scientist. Everything has to be proven to him through science and mathematics. And uh, when he's whisked off to some of these dimensions uh, by God to, to show some of God's great handiwork, he's uh, pretty convinced by the end. And then the, uh, the third of, of the characters from Earth, which, by the way, the rest of the universe calls us the Upside Downers because we do everything upside down. Um, you know, if we want, we take. The Sermon on the Mount says, if you want, you give. <clears throat> if we want people to, to, to obey us, and if we want to lord over people, the world tells us we have to stomp on them. Jesus says we have to serve them. Uh, so we're known as Upside Downers. Anyway, the third Upside Downer in the story is Nathan. Nathan has a reputation of being probably the most spoiled human being on the face of the planet. Of course, all three children go through changes uh, from story to story to story in, in the Bloodstone Chronicles. And they all seem to be really realistically written with um, characteristics that we can all relate to, the selfishness or Denise's anger or the prove it to me, I got to know in facts that, that um, Josh seems to say, how does it prove out? Yes. So yes. I could really relate really well to those people. Nope. And, and that was all intentional. I, I would hope that within the scope of those three, I've pretty much touched on where each of our hearts lie, so that, again, as the reader reads, they'll be able to relate to one of these kids uh, uh, as they, they learn the lessons the kids learn. Now, throughout the book, we have a little phrase that comes back. It's really a fun book to read, but it's beep, bop, bleep, burp. What's that all about? <laughs> That's the sound of the cross-dimensionalizer. Whenever... Um, the children are uh, whisked away to these different dimensions. Uh, the way they travel is through this little, uh, it's kind of like the old Star Trek 
teleporter sort of thing, um, but instead of going from uh, the spaceship to the Earth, they simply go from one dimension to another. It's a faster way of traveling through the universe so the kids can learn the different truths of the kingdom of God. Well, there's interesting aspects to that because they have to go through the center. Uh, Tell us a little bit more about how that is. The center, you and I would know as heaven. This is the place where um, God lives. Only the rest of the universe calls him imager because he imaged and imagined the rest of creation. Uh, so uh, each time the kids go on an adventure, uh, they travel through the center and mo momentarily catch glimpses of, um, of either God or of his handiwork in heaven, which uh, that lays down the groundwork for what they learn later on in each story as they travel to these different kingdoms. Now, they not only are going by themselves, but there's some interesting characters that help them along the way, and one of them has some poetry. Tell us about that poetry. <laughs> yes, there's, there's three um, very distinct uh, characters that uh, have been assigned to these children, have been assigned to these upside-downers, to make sure that they learn the, the principles of the kingdom of God. Uh, and the first character is Aristophanes. He is, uh, has a reputation for being the universe's worst poet. And people uh, aren't afraid to tell him that. <laughs> pardon me? And some of the people aren't afraid to tell him that. Well, yeah, when they're not busy cringing. He uh, tries to speak in rhyme as often as he can, and the rhymes are just so bad that hopefully the audience is laughing and the characters in the book are usually cringing. Uh, he's sort of the, the leader of the group, um, but... Uh, only because the rest of the group lets him be the leader. There's some great uh, humor in that, too, because as they're traveling, they're not quite as accurate when they land as, as they maybe want to be. Yes, the, uh, the, the second member of, of the uh, teaching group, Listro Q, um, is in charge of the cross-dimensionalizer, and uh, he hasn't quite got the knack of it yet. So um, whenever they land in these various kingdoms various dimensions. They don't quite land where they should sometimes. Uh, I think at one point they land actually in the garbage dumpster next to the store that they're trying to land in. Another time they land in a display of pots and pans in a hardware store window. Another time up in a tree. So there's, yeah, he's, he's still learning. Uh, in fact, all the characters are learning. And uh, of course the, the key to that is to try to put enough humor into the story so that as the teaching elements are there. Uh, the entertainment elements are strong enough to uh, to help the medicine go down. Well, as I read through the Bloodstone Chronicles, Bill, I found it to be just a very fascinating and fun read because you've done some things not only with uh, the prose, but you have a little bit of poetry in there, and as well as you have some interesting font applications throughout the book, like when they're trying to listen to Imager's voice, it comes in very tiny font at first to kind of characterize the still small voice that they're listening to and then it builds up bigger and bigger. How did you decide to do things with the text as well as write it? I think um, the key to whatever success I'm enjoying at this time has to do with me getting bored awfully quickly. Uh, writing, as you know, is a slow process, so in order to keep myself entertained, I'm always doing things and adding things uh, that'll keep me interested. Um, and I think, I think that translates over to the children <laughs> because they're... Uh, uh, I get as bored as quickly as they do, and if I can keep myself entertained, uh, hopefully uh, they're entertained as well. Yeah, it's a very entertaining book, uh, The Bloodstone Chronicles, and as any good book has, it has some bad guys, some people, these characters that you've developed. Well, as in our own walks with God and in our own maturity of faith, we have our own set of enemies, don't we? We and, do. Uh, these sort of represent those. The most interesting for me was the merchant of emotions. This is a, a person who controls people through their emotions. Uh, and there are times that the children literally have to either put their trust in what imager, in what God says, or they have to put their trust in their emotions. And the fact that this merchant of emotion um, has a little machine that he hits them with uh, sprays and bursts of emotion, and the children have to learn to overcome what they're feeling and put their trust in what they believe as far as what Imager says. So he's by far my most, uh, for me, the most interesting character. 
there is the uh, the illusionist, which uh, we also know that we have an enemy that loves to counterfeit and make uh, poison look like candy, make uh, the baited hook look like uh, a steak dinner, where underneath all of the glitz and glamour and uh, goodies is uh, something very, very dangerous. So that's what the illusionist represents. And some of the traps that you develop, not wanting to give away too much of the story, they are very fascinating. And when you read through them, at first I thought, oh, this is interesting. But then I pondered it more and more and thought, yeah, that's how it really is in life, that there are these pitfalls that you can fall into if you, if you fall off the way and if you take a wrong turn. So I thought that was very well done. Oh, thank you. I, I really have tried to write at uh, several different levels at the same time with this book. It reads easy enough for a child of, say, eight to read. But yeah, I my nine-year-old's anxious to get into it. She wants to read it really badly. Well, good. But at the same time, some of the um, theological issues, some of the faith issues as, as of our maturity in Christ, um, I'm even getting email from college students. In fact, I received an email just last week from a pastor who's reading it because even though it's written at an elementary level as far as the word choices, uh, hopefully that the, the depth of, of the teaching uh, resonates all the way through uh, ages 8 to 80, if you will. Yeah, you've taken up some pretty tough issues in this book, Bill, like why is pain there and how is pain useful? Also, you've talked about whether death is you know, the right thing or the wrong thing and how do we conquer death or how do we not. And uh, I like the image with the tablet, that anything you wrote on the tablet would come to be. But that didn't work out nearly as well as Denise thought it was going to. Yes, that's the, uh, that's the fourth book in the... In the it's, uh, again, it's four books in one. That's the fourth story in the book. And, and um, I think probably the most relevant for a mature Christian because I've taken the children from exploring who God is to salvation, to allowing God to control their life, to the fourth book where the girl, again, back to Denise, simply doesn't believe God always knows best. She doesn't understand why there's pain. She doesn't understand why there's death. So she's given a tablet where anything she writes on the tablet becomes reality. So she, in essence, gets to run the universe, or at least run Earth for a little period of time. And haven't we all wished we were able to do that? for about 20 seconds. <laughs> and then things start to unravel and get very, very crazy and absurd. And at the end of that story, Denise, and again, I hope the readers will set the book down and realize, you know, what we're going through may be hard, but it certainly beats us trying to do it ourselves. You know, God really does have the answers and, and really does know best in every single situation, even, even the ones that we don't fully understand. So, Bill, you mentioned briefly some of the other allegories and books that are in this kind of style. There's been a long history of those kind of books, Pilgrim's Progress and uh, the Chronicles of Narnia. How does your book compare to, like, the Chronicles of Narnia? Oh, um, first of all, I'm a little humbled to, to, for it to be spoken in the same sentence. <laughs> C.S. Lewis's genius with the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, I think, is unparalleled. Uh, where the Bloodstone Chronicles differs from uh, the Chronicles of Narnia. Um, many, many, many times uh, Mr. Lewis wasn't uh, necessarily focused on teaching. He was focused on just simply telling a good story, and the teaching sort of percolated through it. Uh, the Bloodstone Chronicles is much more intentional. Uh, I sat down with things I wanted to teach and then went and designed a story around them so that you didn't feel that you were being preached at. So um, we're going in, even though we wind up in the same place, we approached it two different ways. His way was to tell a good story and let the teaching percolate when it chose to. Mine was to sit down with very specific teachings and wrap uh, stories around them uh, so that the, the reader would walk away with, uh, with the teaching when they're through. I think what you said about not preaching it was very apropos to this book because I found the Bloodstone Chronicles to be a really fun read but instead of feeling like I was dumped on, it made me think, and it made me ponder, and it made me wonder. And I think those lessons came through a lot more effectively than if you just said A, B, C, and D. I hope so. Uh, you know, so, some of that has to do with um, having 
been writing for about 35 years now. Um, I, I know that if I have something to say, I better make it even more entertaining. Uh, and part of entertainment, I would hope, would be uh, just pondering as when you set the book down to let some of those truths, uh, as opposed to a carnival ride, when you're done with a carnival ride, and you go, well, that was fun, and you forget it. Um, the email I'm getting on this book is those truths, as you said, just sort of keep sticking and percolating, getting people to think about them. I think part of that was because you paint really vivid images. The, the characters are really well developed. They're realistic characters with flaws and faults and, and strengths. But also the encounters and the situations they go through are very well written and you can just see them in your mind and it's just like you're right there with them wondering what's going to happen, how's this all going to work out. Well, that, that's good to hear because if, if you're not involved, if the reader's not involved and, and uh, passionately connected to the characters, uh, you can do all the preaching you want and it's, it's just going to be a sermon. But if, if you can wrap that teaching up in humanity, if you can wrap it up in flesh and blood, characters that you really care for and relate to, uh, suddenly you're rooting them on and hoping they'll do the right thing and, and hopefully learning what the right thing is in the process. Now, Bill, while we have just a few more minutes, can we talk a little bit about your book, the um, When the Last Leaf Falls? Oh, sure. Tell us about that. Um, that's a little novella that I wrote. Um, we started off the program talking about how I write for both kids and adults. Uh, my time's pretty much split, about 50-50. I try to write one adult novel a year, and then um, some of the smaller children's books. Uh, uh, and When the Last Leaf Falls was one of those adult novels, and it, it deals, it's sort of a love story between a father and his 17-year-old strong-willed daughter. Uh, my daughter uh, and I, uh, it's very, very similar to our own relationship. She's very, very, very strong-willed, and just uh, the father learning how <laughs> how to wrap his arms around sometimes the, the uh, prickliness and uh, to love her as Christ uh, loves us. Yeah, teenagers can sometimes be a little bit difficult when you want to hug them and want to be involved in their lives and they want to be on their own. Right, and, and, and this deals with, um, with a father wanting to, he's actually a pastor, wanting to, to make sure that his daughter has faith and uh, she goes through some very difficult times, and he has to sit back and watch uh, as, as God really uh, instructs her and guides her into a deeper relationship with him. Now, Bill, I have yet to read one of your books that I haven't really enjoyed tremendously and really pondered and thought a lot about. Um, you write for children and you write for adults. When you're writing your books, do you set down a specific time every day to say, I'm going to work from 8 to 12 today, or I'm going to do... How, do, how does the mechanics of writing work for you? Oh, yes. Um, it actually starts off, I try to spend about a half hour to an hour a day uh, just with the Lord, quietly, either praying or, or reading and, and sometimes just listening and, and uh, getting ideas. And once I've set down that groundwork, uh, I start writing about 9 o'clock and finish about 5. Uh, I take some breaks in between to refresh my brain, but uh, with all of those hours I put in, I only get about four pages done a day, uh, but hopefully the pages are, are quality enough that uh, they'll, they'll carry the story. So where are your books available, Bill? I always encourage uh, my readers to hit the Christian bookstores first, because those are the people that are really on the front lines doing the fighting. If there's not a Christian bookstore in the area, um, I know all of my adult books uh, are in the uh, most of the major chains, the secular book chains. They usually have me uh, hidden over in the religious section somewhere. And if, if a bookstore is not available, then they can always uh, go online uh, to my website and, and order it that way. And that's uh, www.billmyers.com. But they are available at Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, and the Christian bookstores like Crossroads and Crossroads too. Right, exactly. And, and I would really try to hit the Christian bookstores first because those really are the people that are investing their, their life and their time in the ministry. And they've been doing that for a long time, so we need to support those people. Yes. So, Bill, with your books, uh, is there any talk of making the Bloodstone Chronicles into like a video series or an audio series? What's happening with that? Well, we have um, have already recorded a radio series. Uh, that's going to be released this fall to stations that are interested around the country. Uh, it's the full uh, 
12 hours. We actually have it on CD, so the CD is available to purchase as well. But it'll be 12 hours of, of this book with various voices and so forth. I'm narrating it, and, and we brought in some pretty good voices to do some of the characters. So that's happening, and um, we are talking to folks about uh, about motion picture stuff, but that is always so iffy. You know, everybody everybody says yes, 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 and then when they <laughs> when it comes to coming up with a few uh, million dollars, suddenly they're nowhere to be found. <laughs> now, how has that worked for you in the past with other things going from written form to uh, video or to movies? Well, McGee and me would certainly be uh, uh, something that I'm, I'm very grateful for. Uh, that was um, back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, with Focus on the Family. And that uh, even made it to ABC a few times. They had it as the uh, weekend special. My training is actually in uh, film directing. I started out as a film director and uh, discovered that it was very, very difficult to make a living uh, and maintain my um, spiritual integrity with some of the stuff that I was being asked to, to write and direct. So I eventually uh, started writing novels and children's books for uh, for the Christian audience. Wonderful. Well, Bill Myers, thanks so very much for being on Radio Good News. I recommend your book, The Bloodstone Chronicles, as well as When the Last Leaf Falls. And um, listeners, if you're out there at the bookstore and you see a Bill Myers book, and I haven't recommended the title, buy it anyway because he's a great writer. Bill Myers, thanks for being on Radio Good News. Oh, it's great chatting with you. Thank you. And God bless you. And may The Bloodstone Chronicles outsell Harry Potter two to one. Reach it, brother. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Bye-bye. I'm John Thornton. You've been listening to Radio Good News. I thank you for that. I want you to consider finding a church home because a church home is very essential for your life. You need to find a church home, and this area offers many fine Bible-believing and 